Hi everyone, and welcome to the security track of ASEAN Summit 2022. My name is Kevin, and I'm an Associate Security Solutions Architect from Amazon Web Services. Let's start off with a question. Do you want to build securely in the cloud? I'm sure most, if not all of you, would answer yes. If not, you wouldn't be here. We know many of you are concerned with security in the cloud. And we also know that equally many of you find it challenging to get started or continue on your cloud security journey. In this session, I will show you where to get started with security on AWS while avoiding confusing jargon or technical terms. Instead, I will use straightforward language to share a method to think about security and useful ways you can get started today. We'll start off with how AWS thinks about security and the AWS Shared Responsibility Model. Then, we'll discuss fundamental controls that you should use to secure every AWS account that you manage. From there, we'll introduce the security pillar of the AWS Well-Architected Framework, which will provide a structure for you to think about your security journey. We will dive into each pillar and share what you can do to secure your workloads today. Finally, we'll talk about where you can go next. So, whether you're a sole engineer trying to get your first workload off the ground, or you have a large and experienced security team working together with you, I'm sure you'll find something that you can take away to build securely on AWS today. Let's kick things off with how AWS thinks about security. We believe that security is the top priority. This stems from our obsession with our customers. We value security as we don't want our customers to suffer negative impacts on their business, and we don't want our customers' customers to lose their data and get exploited by criminals. Security doesn't start with buying the most expensive tools. Instead, a good security strategy should start from a strong culture of security across the organization. At AWS, security is everyone's responsibility, not just the security teams. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone, from the developers to the HR teams, will be involved in patching instances and setting up firewalls. Instead, everyone will be responsible for security in their own domain. Take developers, for example. They will be responsible for writing code and building an application that is less vulnerable and more secure. Appropriate and timely escalations are also critical. When in doubt, we will escalate. That could be a person from HR receiving a suspected phishing email and quickly escalating it to the appropriate contact point. Often, people think of the security team as gatekeepers who block development and hinder agility, saying no at every deployment. At AWS, the security team aims to be enablers who set up guardrails to allow developers and engineering teams to innovate quickly while maintaining a strong security posture. We implement both granular preventive controls and automate detection and response to security vulnerabilities. This allows security teams to create guardrails rather than gates, ensuring that developers can build quickly while remaining secure. Finally, AWS sees security as a journey and not a destination. We don't just set up security tools, hire a security team, and say, job's done. Instead, security is a process of iterative and gradual improvement we work on daily. Now, let's see how we can help you build securely on AWS. In today's session, we'll be following Bob. Bob is the chief engineer, and he is in charge of securing his team's simple application on AWS. We have a web server, a database running on Amazon Relational Database Service, or RDS, an S3 bucket for database backups, and an S3 bucket for static content. Notice that Bob is the chief engineer. He's not the CISO or part of the security team. Maybe his company is small, and it doesn't have a security team. Or maybe he's taking the initiative to secure an application that he owns. Regardless, he's taking responsibility for security, and that's terrific. Bob doesn't know much about security, but he knows that it's important. So let's follow him as he secures his application. First, he needs to understand what he's responsible for securing. For that, he turns to the AWS Shared Responsibility Model. When building on AWS, security and compliance is a shared responsibility between AWS and you, the customer. 
AWS is responsible for security of the cloud. This means that AWS is responsible for protecting the physical infrastructure that runs all the services offered in the AWS cloud. As a customer, you are responsible for security in the cloud. This involves things like protecting your account, patching your instances, and encrypting customer data. However, it's also important to note that your responsibility depends on the services that you choose. Infrastructure services like Amazon EC2 are more customizable, but requires more configuration and thus more responsibility for you. For container services like RDS, AWS takes more responsibility and manages aspects like platform and application management. Finally, for abstracted services like S3, AWS takes even more responsibility. These abstracted services are less customizable, but have more security best practices built in and thus less security responsibility for you. The first thing Bob thinks of securing is his account, since that's under his area of responsibility. An AWS account is very valuable. Not only does it store your workloads and customer data, it's also linked to your credit card. Often, bad actors who gain access to your AWS account don't intend to steal data, but spin up compute resources to mine cryptocurrency, racking up a huge bill on your credit card. If you have an AWS account that's not in use, remember to terminate it rather than leave it idle. As a start, Bob begins to implement foundational security controls to protect his AWS account. These controls include protecting the root user with a strong password and multi-factor authentication, or MFA, setting up a CloudTrail trail, ensuring accurate account information, and setting up alternate contact information. A great tip here is to use an email alias that goes to multiple people rather than an email that just goes to one person. Using IAM users instead of the root user, setting up billing alarms to help you keep track of spending. Finally, using AWS Trusted Advisor. Trusted Advisor is a free service which provides recommendations that help you follow AWS best practices. Have you implemented all of these controls in your account? If you haven't, quickly set a reminder on your phone to check after today's summit sessions. Most of these controls are free and easy to implement and will greatly improve your account security. We have a free workshop resource that provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement each control. You can access it by scanning the QR code on the screen. I want to highlight protecting the root user. Your root user is extremely important and gives unlimited access to your account and its resources. You should protect your root user by ensuring it has a complex password. Don't reuse the same password you used elsewhere. Then turn on MFA. Turning on MFA is a powerful way to improve your account security. Let's dive into the console so I can show you how easy it is. After logging in as a root user, you need to click on your username at the top right of the screen and select Security Credentials. Look for the MFA section on the page, click on it, then select Activate MFA. You don't need any fancy hardware to set up MFA. You can easily download an MFA application and use your phone as a virtual MFA device. We also support hardware MFA if you would like or require a higher level of security. For today, we'll be using a virtual MFA device on my phone. All we need to do is scan the QR code on my phone and then fill in two consecutive MFA codes. And that's it. We've successfully set up MFA. I'll need to get an MFA code the next time I log in as the root user. Bad actors will be unable to sign into your account even if they have somehow gotten your password. Take it a step further by having the password holder and the MFA device holder be two separate people. This ensures that no one person can access your AWS root user. Instead of using the root user, you should be using an IAM user with admin permissions for tasks that require admin privileges. Then, delete the root account access keys to prevent your root account from being accessed programmatically. Finally, create an alarm that will notify you when anyone uses the root user. 
Now, let's return to Bob. He has implemented all of the foundational security controls and secured his account. Now, he would like to secure his workload, but is unsure of where to begin. This is where the AWS Well-Architected Framework can be very helpful. The Well-Architected Framework leverages AWS years of experience and documents a set of questions to help you understand if what you're building aligns with best practices. The framework security pillar identifies five core areas that you and Bob can use to build your cloud security strategy. They are identity and access management, detection, infrastructure security, data protection, and incident response. Let's start with identity and access management, or IAM. IAM serves as the backbone of your AWS security strategy. It deals with who, can access what resources. When using IAM, you have two main tools. You can authorize someone's permission to do something, and you can put up guardrails to prevent someone from doing something they are not supposed to. You combine the two to achieve least privilege, where you grant the human or machine identity the permissions required to complete a task and deny everything else. Robust identity management helps ensure that the right systems and people have access to the right resources under the right conditions. Regardless of whether you're a small two-person team or a massive enterprise with hundreds of accounts, AWS Identity Services can help you manage identities, permissions, and resources at scale. As your business grows and your environment becomes more complex, the guardrails that you set up help you remain secure while allowing developers to remain agile, thus accelerating innovation. Furthermore, you can ensure least privileged access to any kind of deployment, applications running on AWS, hybrid workload deployments, and customer-facing web and mobile apps can all benefit. Here are some things you can do to get started improving your IAM security. You should separate your workload into multiple AWS accounts and govern them with AWS organizations. Move away from IAM users and roles and centralize identity management with AWS SSO. Avoid using user credentials for your application. Instead, use roles that provide your EC2 instances or Lambda functions with short-term credentials to communicate with AWS resources. Ensure that you stay organized with tags and resource groups. Control access to your data with policies and conditions. And the last one, use IAM Access Analyzer to ensure least privileged policies. I want to dive a bit deeper into this last one. When you build in development environments, you tend to start off with broader permissions to experiment and determine the AWS capabilities you or your application need. As your workloads and user patterns settle, you will need to refine permissions to only those services and actions that are used to ensure least privilege. However, trying to figure out what services, users, or resources need access to can be a challenging process. This is where IAM Access Analyzer comes in. Access Analyzer works by using your AWS CloudTrail logs, which you set up earlier in the foundational controls, to generate a policy that contains only the services used by the role or user. You can then customize the policy before attaching it to your user or role. So let's say Bob wants to ensure least privilege for the role attached to his instance. He goes to the IAM console, selects the appropriate role, and requests policy generation within a specified time frame. After IAM Access Analyzer reviews his CloudTrail logs, he ends up with a fine-grained policy that grants only the required access to his instance role. He then retrieves it and customizes it before attaching it to his role. This allows him to achieve least privilege for that role. Security is a journey. So remember to set up regular processes to use Access Analyzer to check your IAM users and roles. A good frequency would be every three months, but the more often, the better. Now, let's return to Bob's architecture. We can see that he has implemented a few of the recommendations we discussed. He has moved to AWS SSO, 
added roles to its instances, and used Access Analyzer to ensure least privileged access for his resources. With IAM controls implemented, Bob moves on to detection. Think of detective controls like a home security system. They help monitor your AWS environment and notify you if there are any misconfigurations, threats, or unexpected behaviors. The goal is to ensure visibility of your environment. Once these controls have detected something, you'll be able to quickly respond and secure your workload. AWS has two key detection services you can use to get started. The first is AWS Security Hub. Apart from allowing you to aggregate your security findings across services and regions, Security Hub works with AWS Config to run automated security checks against AWS and industry best practices. Security Hub offers three main security standards that you can compare your environment against. The AWS Foundational Security Best Practices, CIS AWS Foundations Benchmark, and PCI DSS. Let's see how the checks work in the console. After taking some time to evaluate your environment, Security Hub will generate findings for resources that have failed these checks. You can click into each finding, and Security Hub will show a list of resources which have failed the checks, facilitating easy remediation. If you scroll up, Security Hub will also provide an explanation of the check and a link to remediation instructions. If there are specific controls that are not relevant to your workload, you can easily disable them using the Disable button. Security Hub provides a security score that represents the percentage of controls passed. As you remediate each finding, your security score will improve, giving you a way to measure the progress you have made with regards to security. The second service is Amazon GuardDuty. GuardDuty is an automated threat detection service that continuously monitors your AWS environment. It uses machine learning to learn what activity is normal for your environment and combines that with integrated threat feeds to identify threats and anomalous activity. GuardDuty can identify threats like suspected crypto mining on your instances, unusual IAM user behavior, and API calls made from malicious IP addresses. Think of GuardDuty as a building security team. Over time, they learn who often enters the building and can identify strange individuals that they have never seen before. They also receive updates about potentially suspicious individuals or behaviors to look out for and use that knowledge to protect the building. Security Hub and GuardDuty can be set up in just a few clicks, and both have 30-day free trials, so you can begin experimenting with them at no cost. Finally, there's no point setting up detection if you're not notified. So remember to set up tools that can send findings from detection services like Security Hub and GuardDuty to your team over email, Slack, a Jira ticket, or whatever your team is most comfortable with. Let's return to Bob's architecture. He has enabled both Security Hub and GuardDuty and configured them to send any findings over email to his team's email list. Now, Bob moves on to infrastructure security. The goal of infrastructure security is to ensure that your workload is protected against unintended and unauthorized access. Defense in depth is critical to achieving this goal. What we want to do is to implement network layers. It's like an onion. The more the attacker gets into it, the more the attacker is going to cry. Let's look at this architecture to see what that means. A user from the internet trying to access your application hosted on AWS will resolve DNS through Amazon Route 53. The traffic will go to CloudFront, which is integrated with the AWS Web Application Firewall, or WAF. AWS WAF protects your application against common web exploits. Within the VPC, we have a load balancer layer. We have a shared services layer, which is where the NAT gateway can live if our application needs to reach out to the internet. Then we have an application layer. This application layer has no internet access at all. The only way you can get through to it is through the load balancer, through CloudFront, and through WAF. Then we have our database layer. The database has no internet access and only accepts connections from the application layer. This means that attackers can't access the database directly from the internet. 
Traffic at all layers is controlled using security groups, network access control lists, and route tables. When you look at this, you might wonder, if the application instances don't have internet access, then how do I connect to them? That's a great question. Allow me to introduce AWS Systems Manager Session Manager. Session Manager allows you to connect to your instances through the AWS console. This means that you no longer have to deal with access keys, open inbound ports, or maintain Bastion hosts, reducing your attack surface. Access to your instances is managed with IAM permissions and audited with CloudTrail, improving security and auditability. If you're still managing access keys or struggling with Bastion hosts, give Session Manager a try today. It saved me many headaches, and I'm sure it will save you some as well. Let's go back to Bob. Looks like he's begun to leverage AWS Edge services like CloudFront and WAF. He's also started to use Systems Manager Session Manager and close off his inbound ports. Next on his agenda is data protection. Every business deals with data in one form or another, and we need to protect our data to remain compliant and maintain customer trust. But not all data is created equal. Your customers' medical records are much more important than pictures for your website. When it comes to data protection, it's essential to know what data you have, classify it based on criticality and sensitivity, and then implement the right controls to protect it. Let's start with S3. S3 has a very powerful feature called S3 Block Public Access that can be implemented at either the account or bucket level. This feature prevents all public access to the bucket and overrides any other policy that the bucket has. Bob has two buckets, highlighted in the red boxes. One bucket is for static content and one for database backups. He turns on S3 block public access at the account level. This ensures that the data in both buckets will not be accessible due to misconfiguration. Since the database backup bucket is particularly important, Bob takes the extra step of moving the backup bucket to a separate AWS account and placing S3 block public access on that account as well. This provides an additional layer of separation and protection for his critical customer data. So far, we've talked a lot about preventive controls, how to prevent bad things from happening, and detective controls, how to detect when bad things happen. Now, let's talk about incident response and what Bob and you can do when you're notified that a bad thing could have happened. The important thing about incident response is that the more quickly and consistently you respond to security incidents, the more likely you are to reduce potential harm. Incident response on AWS consists of a few components. The first is educate. You need to educate your security operations and incident response teams on how you plan to use the cloud. The second is to prepare. You need to prepare your team with the tools and information they need to respond. Runbooks are helpful here. Runbooks are documents that list out a series of steps to take when a specific incident happens. This ensures your team knows what to do and that the response is consistent. The third is to simulate. Security and incident response is something that needs practice. Like how you can't expect a professional athlete to perform at their best without training, your team won't respond effectively without any simulations. Getting started is easy. Just pick a guard duty finding or come up with a simple incident, such as a compromised EC2 instance, and work through your incident response plan. Finally, after simulating, you iterate. You take what you've learned during the simulation and improve your incident response processes. The AWS Incident Response Guide can help you get started on your incident response journey. And don't forget the power of automation. Many AWS security services can be integrated with services like AWS Lambda, our serverless compute service, to facilitate automated response and speed up incident response processes. Automation helps you respond to potential vulnerabilities more quickly and frees up your security team's precious time. For example, guard duty detects that an instance is potentially compromised. A manual response entails waiting for the security team to read the notification. Then they will need to find and manually follow a runbook, which could lead to human error and time wasted. 
To automate this, the guard duty finding can be configured to trigger an Amazon Event Bridge event, which triggers a Lambda function to isolate the instance automatically. With the instance isolated, the immediate danger has been mitigated, and the security team can spend their time engaging in root cause analysis. So let's see how Bob has implemented incident response measures. He has pulled in his colleague, Mary, to be part of the incident response team. They've created a runbook and done some simple automation. With incident response completed, Bob has gone through all five pillars and improved his security posture. This is a great start to his cloud security journey. In summary, this is what we covered. We first discussed how AWS views security and the shared responsibility model. Then we went over some simple practices for basic account hygiene. These include controls like accurate account information, MFA for a root user, and setting up AWS CloudTrail. After these fundamental controls, we introduced the AWS Well-Architected Framework as a method to think about and structure your security strategy. We can recap the different pillars by going through Bob's architecture one last time. This is Bob's original architecture. Then Bob adds foundational controls to protect his AWS account. The first security pillar is IAM, which deals with who can access what resources under which conditions. The goal of IAM is to strive towards the principle of least privilege. For Bob, that means using AWS SSO for human identities, IAM roles for machine identities, and IAM Access Analyzer to scope down permissions. The next pillar is detection. Think home security system that monitors your AWS environment and provides you visibility of potential misconfigurations, threats, or unexpected behavior. Two services that Bob implemented to get started is AWS Security Hub and Amazon Guard Duty. After that is infrastructure security. We want to add layers to our application for defense in depth so that any attacker is going to have a hard time getting through. Bob implemented edge services like CloudFront and WAF for additional layers and reduced his attack surface by closing ports and using Systems Manager, Session Manager. Then we move on to data protection. The aim is to know what data you have, classify it, and protect it appropriately. To protect his sensitive customer data, he moved the bucket with important database backup data to a separate account and turned S3 block public access on at the account level for both accounts. Finally, we have incident response. Incident response is related to what you do if bad things happen. Key to incident response is run books so that your responders know what to do during an incident and automation to make responses consistent and save your team time from repetitive tasks. Bob brought in Mary to be part of the incident response team. They wrote run books and configured automation. To ensure that they stay sharp and improve their processes, they also run a simulation once a quarter. So this is the architecture that we have helped Bob with. It's quite different from where we started and is more secure. You too can use the AWS Well-Architected Framework as a way to structure and think about your security strategy in a holistic manner. But this isn't the end. Security is a journey of iterative improvement. Make an organizational habit to review your security posture along these five areas in the AWS Well-Architected Framework and see what areas you can grow in. And if you need any help, you can refer to our extensive security solutions library or reach out to the AWS team who would be happy to support you. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. Now that you've learned how to get started, stay tuned to find out other ways to continue your cloud security journey with the other speakers today. To gain more confidence and hands-on experience building securely with AWS, you can access digital training built by AWS experts attend our instructor-led classes by qualified AWS instructors, and learn how to design, deploy, and operate highly available, cost-effective, and secure applications on AWS. Validate your technical expertise with AWS certifications. Thank you again for attending. Please take the time to fill out our survey so that we can better understand the topics and services you would like to know more about.